He's a longtime member of the Warren uh, Astronomical Society, and he's cur he currently serves as their first vice president. He's a visual observer, a star hopper, and sometimes astronomical sketcher, and a recovering cosmology aficionado. <laughs> And we have a special theme for this month. I know Valentine's is over, but we for the month of February, we have our uh, Satellites of Love missions to Venus. Venus is our sister planet, and understanding its history and evolution is probably important to understanding Earth's past and future. In recent years, Mars has gotten the attention and the funding, but it was not always this way. In this presentation, Jonathan will review humankind's past explorations of the real planet and look forward to possible future missions. Please welcome Jonathan King. Thank you. All righty. Well, so just to continue on what Sandra was, what Sandra was saying, um, you know, Obviously, we can all think of many Mars missions that we've paid attention to in the last few years. And uh, with Venus, it's not quite that way. So today we're going to talk about our sister planet, all the visits that humankind has paid to it so far, and uh, review some of the best and most interesting uh, missions that we've had to our sister planet. So why should we care about Venus to start with? Uh, so, Venus can tell us a lot about home. You know, in the history of humankind's exploration of the universe, it helped us discard the Ptolemaic system. So Galileo's letters on sunspots used Venus's phases and changes in size to support the Copernic solar system. It totally ruled out the Ptolemaic universe. And uh, didn't quite prove the Copernican universe, but it a huge advance in that direction. Uh, the transits of Venus, Edmund Halley's uh, drive to to observe transits of Venus across the Earth using James Gregory's method to calculate the distance from Venus to the Sun and thus from us to the Sun and to figure out the scale of our solar system. So even though we never quite got it 100% figured out until we could actually shoot a radar beam at the planet, uh, it still helped us get the general scale right. And uh, Venus was sort of the first uh, planet, the first way we could start thinking about looking at unreachable worlds. So it really helped us prepare to observe exoplanets. So from Vesto Slipher in the 1920s forward, uh, do, we've been doing spectroscopy on Venus and it's helped us practice a what is now a major part of modern explorations of our universe. So, and most importantly, it might tell us, hopefully it doesn't tell us too much about our planet's future, but uh, it understanding what happened on Venus and hopefully how we can prevent it from happening here is uh, something that we should all care a lot about. So, so, woo! Sorry, over over skipped. So here's a shot of Venus from Magellan uh, in sort of natural colors, and here's Earth from Apollo 17. So this is to scale. Um, Venus is our sister planet. It's 0.95 Earths in radius. It's you know it's 0.5 of Earth's radius. It's 0.9 Earths in surface area. It's 0.7 Earths in volume, 0.82 Earths in mass, and it has a surface gravity very close to Earth's, 90% of Earth's gravity. One area where it's really different is the surface temperature of 864 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and the more we start to look at the actual atmosphere of the planet, the less like Earth it starts to look. So. So this is a shot from the great pioneer Venus orbiter, probably the most successful spacecraft ever to go to Venus. Uh, you may notice that these don't look like the kinds of chemicals we have in our atmosphere. So if we compare Earth to Venus, Earth has 78% nitrogen. Venus has 96.5% carbon dioxide. Earth has 21% oxygen. Venus has no free oxygen in its atmosphere. 
Earth has, you know, comparable, roughly comparable amounts of argon, roughly comparable amounts of neon and helium, uh, you know, maybe an order of magnitude difference, but they're very small quantities to begin with. But the, uh, obviously, 96.5% carbon dioxide versus 0.4% carbon dioxide makes a huge difference. The Earth also has water vapor in dramatically differing uh, quantities depending on how close you are, you know, where in the atmosphere you are, whereas Venus has a very small amount of water vapor in its atmosphere. So, so it's not you know, really our sister planet in terms of its atmospheric makeup, but in terms of understanding how it got to this point, how all the oxygen got captured as part of compounds is really relevant to us because, you know, that uh, there's a lot of different ways to have terrible things happen to our atmosphere and we'd like to avoid them. So, without, with that out of the way, uh, who wants to hazard a guess as to how many missions have gone to Venus? Three. Three? Four. Five? Five? All right. What if I told you 44 missions to Venus? Now, the thing is, of those 44, not that many made it there. So there have been 28 successful missions to Venus so far. But I think the real reason that people have not heard of missions to Venus is who is actually sending missions there. And the blue is the U.S., the yellow is the European Space Agency, the white is Japan Space Agency, and all that red is Russia, the Soviet Union, and now Russia. Actually, modern Russia has not sent anything to Venus. This is all the Soviet Union. So... In the Cold War, for one thing, it wasn't publicized very well. And for another thing, we didn't really want to hear about scientific successes behind the Iron Curtain. So we're going to be talking a lot about the Soviet space program in the early parts of this. And uh, then as they leave the scene, we'll be talking about some more modern missions. So as you may have noticed, of all of those, this first two rows of missions, many of them didn't make it. And that's because the Soviet space program had, uh, let's say, some quality control issues. Um, so for those of you who know Sergei Korolev, he was a brilliant man, a wonderful manager, but in terms of his ideas about quality and testing, not the best. So. Shazeli Sputnik blew up. Uh, Venera 1 actually did make it to Venus. It flew by. It was dead as a doornail, but it was the first man-made object to fly by another planet. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Mariner 1 uh, failed to get out of Earth orbit. Uh, and actually, right here in 1962, Russia was already sending a lander to another world. So that's pretty interesting. So now the U.S., this is one of the areas where the U.S. actually did better than the Soviet Union in the early part of the space race. Mariner 2 became the first living spacecraft to visit another world. So one of the most interesting observations that Mariner 2 took as it flew by on August 2nd, August 27th, 1962, 21,000 miles away, uh, it recorded the temperature on Venus for the first time. So it determined that the atmosphere was about 500 degrees Celsius, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So the Russians did keep trying. They really, really wanted to get places. And so, despite the lack of a successful flyby, they started sending landers in earnest. So Zond 1 here uh, had uh, actually made it to Venus. Venera 2 made it to Venus. Venera 3 made it to Venus, dropped a lander into the atmosphere, but as soon as it got into the atmosphere, it died and crash landed. So, and you'll see this cosmos here. Mostly we're gonna be talking about Venera landers. That's the, the Russian word for Venus. Uh, but cosmos is 
what they called, well, you'll see in a second. So this is Sergei Korolev. Uh, he uh, was encouraged by his higher-ups to spend his time actually getting cosmonauts uh, into interesting things in orbit, maybe to the moon, uh, and they thought that him splitting his focus between the crewed missions and the unmanned missions was undermining his ability to get either of them right. So the historical record is kind of hazy on whether he handpicked a successor or the central committee of the Politburo uh, successor, but this entire program was transferred into the Lavochka which is still around today, as is Sergei Korolev's group. Uh, the Opitnoi Konstruktio Konstruktovie Bureau. Um, so, uh, so there, uh, if you hear about Energia, which is Russia's leading, uh, leading spacecraft uh, concern, that's still Sergei Korolev's outfit, and it's actually, they even put his name on it now. So, once, uh, <laughs> so when the Lavochkin group took over this program, they, they took it over for uh, Venera 3 and Cosmos 96. Uh, they started doing testing on Earth, which was something that Korolev was totally against. He only wanted to do bench testing for crewed missions, and even then he really didn't want to do any testing until you had the whole rocket ready to go. Um, so they did a bench test with, a, with the early version of Venera 4, and they found out that it conked out at less than half of the G-forces that it was supposed to be able to handle. So that was probably the reason so many of the early ones died. So once the Lavochkin Bureau takes over, they actually start having successes. So Venera 4 actually succeeded in measuring the starting to take detailed chemical readings of the Venusian atmosphere. It was the first successful in situ study of another planet done by humankind. Um, it also proved that there was it, there could not be liquid water on the surface of Venus. So Mariner 5 on its way, uh, so basically Mariner 4 was a Mars probe. They built a second probe in case that rocket blew up. When Mariner 4 had a successful mission, NASA said, well, we have the spacecraft ready to go. They just uh, reworked the instruments, added some new instruments, and sent it to Venus instead. So, so it uh, provided detailed information about the planet's atmospheric pressure, so it measured it to be about uh, 75 to 100 Earth atmospheres, and measured an exact temperature. It found that there were no corollaries to the Van Allen radiation belts around Venus, and it basically, you know, and it also proved that Venus didn't have an active magnetic field like Earth did. So it basically started to tell us the many ways in which Venus isn't so much a sister world. Uh, the Russians kept up, uh, so they actually started to have successful landers. Venera 5 and 6 both parachuted down. They, they were somewhere between a lander and an impactor. They weren't meant to survive on the surface, but they were intended to, on the parachute, go down very slowly through the atmosphere. So each of these craft survived for 50, around 50 minutes in the Venusian atmosphere. Uh, they had photometers. Uh, well, Venera 5 successfully managed to see how much sunlight was getting through to each layer of the atmosphere. Venera 6, the door on the photometer never opened, so they had a lot of problems like that. Uh, the spacecraft also carried the state coat of arms of the USSR and a base relief of Vladimir Lenin to the surface. So, uh, and then they melted. Um, so these were successes, not complete successes, but still uh, managed to do some, you know, ranging to the ground. Uh, and then we get a complete success. So Venera 7... Uh, it actually landed, it took 
readings from the surface. The only problem it had was that, sort of like the Philae lander from uh, the ESA's recent mission to our asteroid, uh, it landed and then it rolled on its side and then it had a hard time transmitting back to Earth. But uh, it did measure the exact surface temperature, which earlier we had only really known sort of the middle uh, atmosphere temperature. So Venera 8, same design, it uh, had everything worked correctly this time. So they got to, uh, they got precise measurements of illumination at different levels in the atmosphere. It uh, landed in sunlight about 500 kilometers from the Terminator, and uh, it sent back data from the surface for 50 minutes before it melted. So, uh, and it also, what was really important about this lander was that it confirmed all of the previous, because there had still been uncertainty about all the previous measurements from the earlier craft, this one, because everything worked, it really gave them confidence that everything that had been measured so far was actually accurate. So, throughout this, uh, there were still failures. Cosmos 167, Cosmos 359, Cosmos 482. Why are they Cosmos and not Venera? The reason is because the Soviets didn't talk about any programs that didn't work. So, all of these would have been Venera if they succeeded. So, Cosmos 167 was the sister mission of Venera 4. 359 was the sister mission of Venera 7, and 482 is the sister mission of Venera 8. All, all of the Soviet Venus missions went as two spacecraft to Venus at the same time, so that they could get confirmation at the same time. They just had a hard time getting both of them to work at the same time. A lot of times what happened with these is that they would get stuck in low Earth orbit, and fail to do the burn to exit low Earth orbit and go on to Venus. And uh, so when that happened, the Soviets thought, well, at least it's scaring the Americans. They think we're putting up some kind of, you know, weaponry up there or something. So, so Mariner 10 was the next significant U.S. mission. And uh, it was on its way to Mercury, the, the main science mission of Mariner 10 was to observe Mercury close up. But uh, while it was passing by, it took the first great close up flyby photos of Venus. So it got closer than anyone had before. Most of these earlier missions didn't have any kind of photography capability at all, much less the ability to transfer back images to Earth. So this was a huge revelation in terms of our picture of Venus up close, because obviously from from here, it's hard to see all these details in Venus's clouds. So, now, the Soviets actually really, really wanted to get landers taking photos on the surface of another world. So, uh, if, if you compare this, this might look like a very different shape to the, these uh, sort of ball-shaped or football-shaped landers. But you'll see, if you look closely, that that kind of sphere is still here. They just add more and more parts to it. They increase the antenna. They, they build bigger antennas. They build more uh, equipment into the sides of it. But fundamentally, it's still the same design. They also made sure it didn't tip over. Um, so... Venera 9 and Venera 10 both successfully land, both successfully take photos. So these are actual photos from the surface of Venus. So, so this is uh, October 10th, 1975, uh, October 22nd, October 25th. So they landed nearby one another, they took photos. But these photos, you know, they're fairly detailed. A lot of people have, don't even know that photos of the surface of Venus from the surface of Venus exist. Uh, but it turns out there was raw data from these spacecraft that had never been processed using modern technologies. And an amateur sort of scientific historian named Don P. Mitchell, 
whose website is mentallandscape.com, took was able to use his contacts in the former Soviet space program to get the raw data and reprocess it. So he got this garbled view up here. He figured out that these are actually the result of bit encoding errors, fixed the errors, and was able to produce a much clearer view. So, so this is this this top one is the the one that was published. The bottom one is the reprocessed one. So it's almost like high definition by comparison. Similarly, the Venera 10 raw data has all these interference bands, but there's really data here. It just got shunted over in the data stream that came back. So this one really looks like it's really night and day from what was published publicly earlier. So, uh, and his website is just full of amazing stuff. So I, if you're interested in going deeper in this, this is how I got into this subject in the first place is I found his website and I said, I never knew that any of this happened. So, all right, so now we are ready for the first detailed global map of Venus. So Pioneer Venus Orbiter went into orbit around Venus in 1978. Does anyone know when it finally died? 1992. So, so this was the longest lived mission to ever be operating at Venus and uh, did tremendous work for, you know, well over, well over, about 15 years. So. Is this map from the Flat Venus Society? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, one thing to notice is that all, for whatever reason, uh, a lot of the features on Venus are named after Venus. So you have like the continents on Venus, you have Aphrodite Terra, Aphrodite is Venus. You have Ishtar Terra, Ishtar is Venus. So it's kind of an interesting naming system. I don't think you see that. You don't see Eras Planitia on Mars, but I don't know. So uh, at the same time that the Pioneer orbit, Venus Orbiter went into orbit, we also launched our first, and I think only ever, uh, Venus lander. So the Pioneer Venus, the Pioneer Venus uh, multi-probe, multi you know, we didn't go for half steps. Once we decided to have landers, we figured we might as well have five landers all launched at the same time. Um, so basically, there was a bus here, and the bus worked a lot like the Laddie mission to the moon where the bus uh, or uh, Juno I think is going to work with Jupiter where the bus kind of slowly entered Venus's atmosphere and the the goal was to measure things as it died um, but then it had these four probes and there was one big probe uh, that they so basically they tried to they tried to put these probes in interesting places. So there was one big central probe that went to the day side of the Terminator right at the Terminator. There was a north Terminator probe that went into the night side of the Terminator. Then there was a day small probe and a night small probe that went respectively well into the day side of Venus and the night side of Venus. So all of these had a whole bunch of sensors on it. Uh, the bus itself did ion mass and new neutral mass spectroscopy. Um, the day probe, you would think that the day side of Venus would be the least hospitable, but the day probe actually survived, even though none of these were meant to survive on the surface, the day probe survived on the surface and transmitted data back for almost an hour. Um, so basically, we they, they answered a lot of questions. So it wasn't known like how different are the temperatures between the day side and the night side. What are the winds like around the Terminator where you might have a big temperature shift? So what they found out is that between the day side and the night side, uh, there's only a 10 
degree Celsius difference. So, or a 20 degree Fahrenheit difference. So basically, it's almost a constant temperature all over the planet. Uh, the ground pressure is around, uh, depending on where you were on the planet, between 86 atmospheres and 95 atmospheres. So an unpleasant place to be, besides the whole sulfuric acid uh, atmosphere around you. Uh, they identified three distinct cloud layers, all with different characteristics. And uh, they discovered that the ratio of different isotopes of argon in the atmosphere was way different than Earth's. So that told them that maybe the similarities between Venus and Earth's history were less than we initially thought. Um, because no, whatever caused the sulfuric acid uh, carbon dioxide atmosphere around Venus, it shouldn't have affected the noble gases very much. So that, uh, that definitely added a new area of mystery to the differences between Earth and Venus. So, um, they also determined that in the middle layer of the three cloud layers, the wind averaged 200 meters per second. So, very fast winds in the middle layer. At the base of the middle layer, at the transition between the middle layer and the lower layer, it was only 50 meters per second, still pretty fast. But on the ground, there's no wind. It's, uh, well, one meter per second. So it's a nice breeze. So that really challenged people's ideas about how Venus's atmosphere worked. Now, Russia continued to send probes there. Uh, Venera 11 and 12 both failed. Uh, they succeeded in collecting important data. They recorded gamma ray bursts. They proved, they, were the first probes to actually determine that thunder and lightning were happening in the Venusian atmosphere. So it's even more pleasant than we thought. And uh, they confirmed that on the surface there's a lot of carbon monoxide. So another way to die. Um, but both of these had color cameras. They were the first color cameras ever to arrive at Venus. Neither of the lens covers would open. So so they landed on the surface and just sat there. So, however, Venera 13 and 14 were almost uh, identical in design. So this is actually at the Udvar Hazy Center, I think. Um, and uh, they successfully landed. So this is another reconstruction from Don Mitchell. Uh, so, like, I don't... Did, who knew that we had pictures from Venus's surface that looked like this? Like, like that's a pretty awesome picture. So, um, and uh, we do have color, although the high res is uh, all black and white. But we do. This is real color. This is natural color uh, from the surface of Venus. So Venera thirteen, and then about a week and a half later, Venera fourteen uh, was able to get these color photos from the surface of Venus and send them back. So those were the last landers that, uh, I believe those were the last landers period on Venus to the present day. And again, that was, uh, that was 1981. That was when I was born. So, uh, however, the Soviets did keep doing science there with Venera 15, 16. You might see this gigantic radar dish here. Um, they actually were the first probes to do a high resolution mapping of the surface of Venus. So you can see that the detail here is not like anything that we saw in any of the earlier shots. So they mapped about 30% of the surface of Venus. Uh, both of them were in roughly polar orbits. Um, and, uh, I would have thought they would have gotten more than that, but I don't know how long they actually survived in orbit. So the last successful, the last Russian missions of any kind to Venus were the Vega craft. Uh, and this photo is from the Udvar Hazy Center in Washington, DC. So does anyone, so we went from Venera to Vega. So. So the VE actually comes from Venera, 
Does anyone want to guess what the G8 comes from? It's 1984. So, well, <laughs> so it is a person's name. So, uh, in the in the Cyrillic alphabet, there isn't a letter for that translates to H. So when they say Edmund Halley, they say Edmund Halley. And so this is G-A-L-L-E-Y. Uh, so this is the Venera Halley uh, probe. And so this was actually a super complex probe. What it did was it dropped a lander onto the surface. It dropped a balloon that drifted freely or through Venus's atmosphere, and then it had an actual orbital craft that continued on and successfully rendezvoused with Halley's Comet in 1986. So both of these missions were total successes. Um, everything worked right. The landers landed, uh, collected actually some very... Uh, technical data uh, that nobody really seems to be able to tell me what it is. Um, uh, some, uh, I will say that uh, Vega 1 had some issues where it got buffeted around by the clouds and that triggered it into thinking that it had landed. So it uh, turned on a bunch of its surface instruments 20 kilometers above the surface. And so it didn't collect everything that it was trying to. But it was really cool that the two, uh, the two weather balloons that we put into Venus's atmosphere, while they were alive, they actually traversed 30% of the circumference of the planet each. So imagine, you know, imagine a, a balloon in our atmosphere going from New York all the way into China. So it's uh, it was a pretty cool achievement. And so they were at the bottom of sort of the transition between the top layer and the middle layer. Where So the top layer of Venus's clouds is actually very cool compared to the rest of the planet's atmosphere. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the future, but uh, the top layer is where we might want to explore more in the future. So finally, the U.S.'s marquee mission. So I don't know if you got the chance to look at this Venus globe here, but... Uh, this is all Magellan data taken starting in 1989. And uh, Magellan was an amazing high definition radar mapping system. And uh, for the first three years that Magellan was at Venus, it was actually able to coordinate with the Pioneer Venus orbiter so that they could observe together. And so it was uh, really awesome that, this, that that craft managed to live so long that it was able to actually work with a new orbiter. So Magellan was able to take a high resolution map of 98% of the surface. I don't know if you turn this globe around at all, but the only part that it didn't get to map is down here at the South Pole. You'll see some empty space, but uh, still 98% is pretty decent. And it got a high resolution gravity map of 94% of the planet. It uh, so this is this is that same map in the Flat Earth Society version, um, and you can see how the South Pole is kind of just a slur of pixels. Dragons. Yeah, exactly. I, I, there's dragons everywhere. Um, and uh, what was really cool was that with the gravity map, we were able to create a three-dimensional model of Venus, which is something that you know we might not have expected to be able to do. So you can actually, unfortunately, there used to be, uh, it used to be available some flyovers where you could fly over Venus and see some of the mountains on the surface. Uh, I wasn't able to find that anymore. So that used to be downloadable from NASA's site. But uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of amazing sort of, post-processed views of what it would look like on the surface. Yes, sir? Uh, so Venus is 
does not have a liquid core. Um, there is a lot of controversy because we have seen some really weird behavior on the surface of Venus. And actually, I'm going to talk about that a little bit in when I talk about the only current mission there. Um, but I think... Uh, I think there are still a lot of people who suspect that there is some kind of volcanism happening, but without a, without having an active core, uh, some of the driver of volcanism goes away. So now we get to the dead zone. So this is the what I call the chopped liver years, where we're primarily interested in Venus as a way of doing a gravity assist for spacecraft that are going to more interesting places. Uh, so Galileo uses Venus uh, as a gravity assist to get to Jupiter in 1990. Cassini uses Venus as a gravitational assist to get to Saturn. It actually does two flybys in 1989, 1998, and 99. And then Messenger, on its way to Mercury, uh, does two flybys as well. So, um, at least Messenger looked at the planet when it drove by, is all I'm saying. Um, but they, none of these missions did any serious science on Venus. So, finally, the European Space Agency launched their one and so far only uh, probe to Venus, Venus Express, which got there in 2006. And what it was intended to do was provide a high-resolution view inside the Venusian atmosphere over long periods of time. So it actually, this is another, remember how uh, Mariner 5 was reusing parts left over from Mariner 4? Well, this is using parts that were left over from Mars Express. They had this spare spacecraft in case the thing blew up. And they said, well, we could send it to Venus. They also used extra parts from the Rosetta mission to that went to uh, Ceres. And 67P, Churasov Gerasimenko. Um, it uh, confirmed the Venera 11 observations that light so up until Venus Express got there no one else had ever confirmed the Venera 11 and 12 observations that there was thunder and lightning in Venus's atmosphere this did it it actually proved that there's more thunder and lightning going on in Venus's atmosphere than there is on earth um, it discovered that Venus has an ozone layer it discovered a region where dry ice actually could form in the upper atmosphere. So we're talking about really cool. Um, and also that there is a stable double polar vortex at the bottom of Venus. So the one place that we didn't look when we had an orbiter there. And uh, most importantly, it provided evidence that Venus did, at some point in its evolution, have liquid water oceans. So that is, that sort of tipped the scale back towards Venus being a plausible sister planet to us. Whereas the, the balance had been swinging away from that from a long time, Venus Express sort of tipped it back in that direction. So it only got there in 2006. It had some, it only had about four really good years. It started having trouble. It would turn off, go into a safe mode for a year at a time. So it basically turned on briefly in 2011, turned on briefly in 2013, turned on briefly in 2014, and then they weren't able to recover it after that, and uh, it ended up crashing into Venus in 2015. So, now, I don't know how much anyone has heard about the Japanese space program. They've had some tremendous successes, but they always want to make it exciting. So, like the Hayabusa probe that collected samples from an asteroid and returned it to Earth. It was amazing. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And they still managed to get a few particles of asteroid dust and return it safely to Earth. Uh, a lot of their, for whatever reason, a lot of their programs seem to end up that way. Akatsuki, their mission to Venus, was another one of those. They got out to 
Venus in 2010. They tried to do a burn to get into orbital insertion. The main engine of their spacecraft didn't work. They blamed it on salt deposits. And uh, so they turn on the engine. It doesn't turn on. They go shooting by Venus towards the sun, and they're like, oh, great. So they orbited the sun, uh, and five years later, to the day that they tried the first time, without being able to use the spacecraft's main engine or any of its fuel, they managed to get into a much more distant orbit using only the attitude control thrusters. So, like, talk about pulling it out of the fire. I mean, this is five years later, and they managed to get a working orbiter that is still working to now, it has suffered a lot of wear and tear from the unintended time in space and travel through space. Two of the infrared cameras that it's supposed to use to observe the surface had to be disabled in 2016, six years after they were supposed to start being used, because they kept draining the battery. So they were working, but they just were playing havoc with the whole power system of the computer. So... Even though they were doing great science, they had to turn them off just to keep the spacecraft alive. So, I wasn't able to get the movie version of this, but there's actually a movie of this uh, showing the uh, showing sort of the sunlight, the the Terminator move across the surface of Venus, and uh, they were they discovered some really interesting things. They observed that. In four hours, the super-rotating ca clouds ro captured on camera moved by about 10 degrees. So basically, uh, there's a lot more interplay happening between the layers of clouds than we previously had thought. In 2017, scientists uh, released data showing that there was a large stationary wave. So basically in the upper atmosphere where it's usually moving at around 100 meters per second uh, there was basically sort of a resonance wave happening uh, and the idea is that it might be related to atmospheric flow over a mountain similar to how gravity waves work on earth and that it might actually be related to uh, things happening on the surface and possibly I think that is where the volcanism may have come into play um, and later that year Akatsuki scientists uncovered data suggesting that the wind speeds at the equator uh, could actually change a lot more than any studies previously before all of the observations suggested that the wind speeds were very constant around the equator, and uh, Akatsuki actually got data suggesting otherwise. Uh, so Akatsuki was part of a big package with uh, several other craft. Um, so one of them was kind of a failure. Shin-N, or Unitech-1, was a student spacecraft. It was basically kind of a CubeSat that was launched as part of that package. It was the first student-built spacecraft ever to pass through the Van Allen belts, uh, but it never was able to work when it got to Venus. And, uh, whoops, I think I skipped a... Uh-oh. Looks like I lost a solar sail. Oh, well. So there was also an Icaros uh, solar sail that went out with Akatsuki and uh, it was the first interplanetary solar sail. I missed that slide, it was a pretty... Um, so it, it wasn't able to collect a ton of data, but it did successfully, uh, it did prove that a solar sail could work in interplanetary space, and it did collect some interesting data. Um, so now we're back into the chopped liver years. Uh, the Parker Solar Probe, I don't know if anyone heard about this, but the Parker Solar Probe actually did a gravitational assist flyby of Venus in October. Uh, it has six more to do, and to that I say, Venus, it's just using you. Um, so literally, this is the only picture the Parker Solar Probe has taken yet. 
There's the Milky Way. That's cool. There's this bright shining light in the darkness. That's not Venus. That's Earth. Like, it couldn't even look at Venus when it went by. It's just very disappointing. So, also, uh, Bepi Colombo. I don't know if you've heard about this. This launched uh, last year as well. It's on its way. It's the new Mercury probe but launched by the ESA. Uh, so it's also going to use Venus as a gravitational assist. And it's not fair to call this a chopped liver uh, mission. It actually does have a lot of observations that it's going to do on its two flybys of Venus in 2020 and 2021. But this is the only thing besides Akatsuki that's out there in space that is going to look at Venus. So from there on, uh, we're in the realm of hypothetical. India has had a lot of success with its Chandrayaan-1 moon mission and its Mangalyaan-1 Mars mission. Uh, now it has its sights set on Venus. Shukrayaan-1 is supposed to launch at 2023. There aren't any actual mock-ups of it. I can't really find any evidence that it's truly funded, so I don't know if this is going to make it, but it's got a cool logo at least. Um, and uh, Russia is working on Venera D. This is the first, since the fall of the Soviet Union, this is the first Russian Venus mission. Uh, whether or not this has been funded, this has been in the Roscosmos budget for 10 years now. Still hasn't really gotten anywhere. Supposedly they're targeting a 2026 launch. I'm not really holding my breath on it. This is actually, so we've been talking about craft that were meant to go to more interesting places being re, you know, the extra parts being used for Venus missions. The, this was built out of the extra parts of Phobos Gruent, the mission to Mars's moon Phobos that unfortunately failed. So there's always the possibility that they'll try to salvage it for another go at Phobos. So, what comes next? So those, those two programs are the only programs that have any kind of funding at all associated with them for Venus study. So what comes next? Uh, what's really interesting is, uh, as Detroiters, the only research that NASA is doing into going back to Venus is happening in Sandusky, Ohio at the John Glenn Research Center. So this is a special testing chamber called GEAR, the Glen Extreme Environments Rig, uh, down, down there in Sandusky. And uh, in 2017, July 13th, 2017, they were able to build a computer that worked in pseudo-Venus atmosphere for more than 80 days. It more doubled the previous record of 42 days. So it's uh, the Glenn Research Center is basically the only group of people in the U.S. who are really still fighting for Venus. So they have some really awesome plans. They want to have a cloud top drone. Unfortunately, this rendering is from like 2010, uh, which tells you how fast this is moving. And they've also been working on some plans for a land sailing rover that is just going to sort of let the wind blow it around the surface. So some really neat ideas. Nothing that's funded. They try to get stuff in all the time. I'll tell you one funny thing. So uh, if we go all the way back to those balloon orbiters, this photo taken and uploaded to uh, Wikipedia was taken by the director of Venus Research at the Glenn Research Center. So he's he's really a geek like us. So, um, so that is the state of things today. So I'm going to play this video. I don't know if I can do it here. So this is, uh, that is a very low resolution 3D model of Venus as taken by the Magellan mission back in 1989. So that's it for me. I'm sorry. Different color represents what? Oh, well this is, this is like true color. This is like if you took Venus and removed the, uh, yes. Yeah. On, on this map, uh, so the, the false color on this, uh, you can't really see, but it's rainbow colored. Um, 
This basically represents different chemicals on the surface. So super colorful version that we looked at earlier is the same as this. All right, any questions? Are you going to the, uh, the Cosmos 482? I'm sorry, say that again? If it was yes. Made it, it's supposed to fall back into Earth orbit and crash into the planet this year? Awesome! I did not know that. That's uh, interesting, because at least it didn't have nuclear power, I don't think. So. How many of you have nuclear power? I don't think any of these did. Um, and actually, one of the other cool things that Glenn is working on is actually like a steam boiler, <laughs> um, which is, you know, if you have, if you got the uh, atmosphere for it, why not? Um, yes, sir. What do we know about the composition of the soils and the rocks? Uh, we know a fair amount, um, but obviously having an actual lander that could dig around in it would help more. Um so, with, um, so I don't have the chemical composition. We do know the barest, uh, we, we know sort of what the chemical compositions of the surface are. Uh, we know that Venus is substantially less dense than Earth, but not, but still in the same general ballpark. It's not like the difference between Earth and Mercury, where Mercury is just a chunk of metal, or the difference between Earth and Mars, where Mars is much, much less dense than Earth. So, so like a lot of your pictures, the rust color, does that mean there's iron there? Uh, I, I think it's not so much rust as uh, there's a lot of sulfur. Like, the, the main thing we know is that Venus, you know, it smells really bad there, <laughs> among the many other uh, problems with going there. So, yes, sir. Uh huh. How big were they? They're like bigger than a car. Uh, they were. Um, so they're about. Uh, so the that bulb was sort of the same bulb. It was uh, repurposed from the Soyuz missions. So that sort of bell that the cosmonauts would be in is basically the same size. So it's about big enough to fit two people in, but not huge. Like maybe the size of this area here. It is a large craft, yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? Alrighty, well, oh yes. Just while you were talking, I did the calculation. It's got 1,250 to 1,400 pounds per square inch. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Plus the software grant. Yes. Yeah, you don't want to have inflatable tires on your rover, that's for sure. Alrighty, well, thanks so much. Thank you.